So let's see where we are. Uh, in general, let me make a, a comment about what we've done. We've taken a problem of given a particular prime, can it be expressed as a sum of squares? And we've try, we're trying to relate that to another problem, which is, uh, is minus 1 a square modulo that prime p? Um, and often in mathematics, uh, you'll see two problems, one problem kind of uh, shown to be equivalent to another. And uh, often it's rather, it's not presented very well um, in mathematical writing as to what exactly the significance of that is. Um, and sometimes it's really not that significant that you turn one problem into another if the problems are both hard. And so the, the thing you have, to, as I said before, the thing you have to believe here is that the problem of when things are quadratic residues is, is quite tractable, quite easy to figure out, and has beautiful patterns, and in particular is, has the, the periodicity to it. Um, so we really are replacing a harder problem with an easier problem, even though it's, it's, it's not obvious if you're not used to thinking about the, the quadratic residue problem. So here's, here's the situation we're in uh, with the sum of squares problem. Suppose that minus 1 is a square mod p, which um, supposedly, I, you want to should believe me that that happens exactly when p is congruent to 1 mod 4. Okay, um, and let's actually f pick some a that says that there's some a whose square is congruent to minus 1 mod p. Then you just move it over and just call it 1 squared instead of 1. Uh, so a squared plus 1 squared equals is congruent to 0 mod p. And so we've got a way to represent some multiple of p as a sum of squares. In fact, a rather special sum of squares, where one of them happens to be 1. But of course, we don't know that we can just take away that k. There's, there's nothing to tell us that right now. Okay, so here's what we do. Now we're kind of the, at the end of the digression. Um, you might have thought, where'd the, where'd the i math go? Where'd, where'd the complex numbers go? Where'd the Gaussian integers go? Here's where we combine, put that back in. Okay, we're going to combine that with factoring and the Gaussian integers. Okay, so if minus 1 is a square mod p, that equation that I just wrote down can be written as a plus i times a minus i is kp. This is really crucial. It involves factoring the same number in two different ways, and one of those ways involves something that's a prime. At least, well, it's a prime in the integers. We've already seen that that's, can, that's somewhat subtle. In fact, it's very subtle, and we're going to get into more and more subtleties of that. Um, we've seen that something that was a prime, like 2 um, or 5, can factor in the Gaussian integers. Um, so we have to be real careful about that. Um, but what I want to say, emphasize, is the fact that p divides this product. That's just one way to say that um, a multiple of p is the product a plus, p, a plus i, a minus i. So let's look at what happens in the integers when that happens. So here's the really, really crucial thing. We're not looking specifically at how a prime splits up, what are its factors, we're looking at what happens, what is special when a prime divides some other thing, namely a product of two other integers, okay? And the claim is that when a prime p divides a product of two integers, it must divide either one of the factors. So let me just give you some numerical examples. I'm not going to prove this. It's really not super hard to go through a chain of reasoning to prove it, um, but it's not where I wanted to go with these videos. Okay, but let's just look at some examples. Suppose, let's, let's look at 17. It's a true fact that that divides 102 times 36, which is this big number, 3672. Okay, and if you just check it on the calculator, yeah, it divides out with no fraction, no remainder. Okay, could it fail to be a, a divisor of both 102 and, 102, 102 and 36? And hopefully your intuition says no, it's got to divide one or the other. And it's probably pretty obvious if you're pretty good at arithmetic which one it divides because uh, I picked small numbers. Um, the intuition is somehow, well, I can't split up the prime, so it can't kind of partly, part of 17 divides the 102 and part of 17 divides the 36. It all has to go into one or the other. And I put a question mark here because it turns out that intuition is not very reliable in general. But, in fact, 102, in this case, uh, is the one that's divisible by 17. So it does divide one of those guys. Let's look at a, a purposely a non-example, because this is actually more like the logic that we're actually going to use. Let's look at 57. Uh, that was, there's a famous story about uh, Grotendieck, the very, very famous algebraic geometer, thinking that's prime. Uh, it's probably apocryphal, but anyway, I picked 57 because it's called the Grotendieck prime. It is not a prime, and we'll discover why uh, in just a second. 
it divides into, it's a fact that it divides into 152 times 12. That's 1824. If you check it on the calculator, if you don't trust my arithmetic, yes, it divides out to be a, a whole number. But if you also check, 157, or 57 does not divide into 152, and it certainly doesn't divide into 12, because 12 is smaller than 57. Here's the conclusion. 57 cannot be a prime number, okay? If we believe this statement that if a prime divides a product of integers, then it must divide one of those two integers, okay? So, um, if you believe that and you've got this statement, 57, it's not dividing into one or the other, but it's dividing to their product, the intuition again is that somehow it's splitting up and part of 57 is dividing 152 and part of 57 is dividing 12. It's interesting how, con to me, how convincing that argument is and how fallible it is in the general cases that we're gonna, we're gonna lead to in a couple of videos. Um, anyway, in the integers, this gives you the conclusion that it must factor, okay? It's reducible, and in fact, of course, 57 is 3 times 19, okay? So the question is, why go to so much trouble to discover that 15 is 57 is not prime? Why don't you just look for factors and realize, well, duh, it's divisible by 3? It's because this is a very interesting way to conclude something has factors, and um, it's related exactly to the situation we have. What do we have? We have something where p divides a product. If we can show that p does not divide uh, either of these two factors, that's going to have something to do with primes. Oh, okay. So um, it turns out that it's really, really subtle, this notion of primality in other contexts, namely um, the Gaussian integers and especially when we go beyond the Gaussian integers to um, slightly different problems. Okay, so let's go back to z at join i, the Gaussian integers. So let's look at how the logic goes. Um, p divides the product, okay? Um, but it's very easy to see that it doesn't divide either factor separately. Um, it's not that easy to, if you're in these kinds of situations with Gaussian integers or even more complicated stuff we're going to get to later. It's, it's dangerous, if you want to do this all carefully, to just say, oh, obviously this doesn't divide this, or obviously this is prime, or obviously this is not prime. Um, but this is one of the statements where it's not that tricky because we're actually just dividing by a real number. If you divide complex numbers by reals, you just divide the real part and the imaginary part. This definitely isn't a Gaussian integer because it's fractions, okay? So... Um, here we have this interesting situation. This is exactly like 57, the example of 57. That's why I did that. We've got something where p divides a product. It doesn't divide either, either factor. It cannot be prime in uh, the Gaussian integers, okay? So, in fact, what we're going to do is we're going to split up these two notions. We're going to say that this is our definition of being prime. I know it's not, the usu it's not quite analogous to the usual definition of prime, but we're going to say that's, the, that's what we mean by prime in z adjoint i, the Gaussian integers, because it turns out to be the better notion, the, the more powerful notion. What we would like to say is that p factors, and that's the thing that we really can't be sure of. Um, it's true in the integers, even though I didn't prove it, um, and we're really not sure if that's true in the Gaussian integers. Okay, because remember, once we get that p factors, we talked about this in an earlier video, it turns out it has to factor as u u bar, so therefore it has to be a sum of squares. And that's the end of the story, that's what we wanted to show. But the real distinction is between these two notions that are two possible generalizations of being a prime number in the integers, okay? So we say that a number is prime, or you know, even a Gaussian integer like x plus yi, or really this is a very general thing. Um, I'll bring up the terminology. It's it's this is really talking about in a general. It's called a general ring, something where you can do the arithmetic or operations that you can do in the integers. So um, a number or a Gaussian integer, or whatever, is prime if this statement holds. Whenever n divides a product, then it must divide either c or d. And the claim is uh, that that's really the same as the usual notion of prime in z. But that gets a new name in more general contexts. We say a number is irreducible in these new contexts if it cannot be written as a product unless, well, we always have to say, well, unless a or b is a unit. Obviously, 2 equals minus 1 times minus 2. We don't say that's an interesting factorization. Okay, so as usual, units are not particularly important for factorization. So uh, these two things are different notions. In z, in the integers, you can prove that they're the same. 
and most people uh, are pretty confident that they really should be the same in, in the integers, even if they can't prove it particularly uh, rigorously. Okay, um, and it's interesting that this is what almost always is given as the definition of a prime number in the integers in uh, basic number theory or just like popular expositions, and it's actually not the one that generalizes with the name prime in these interest more interesting contexts. Okay, so um, a little bit about the logic here. What can we say? So I've s I've already claimed that in ordinary integers, this is why you've never heard of this distinction. If maybe um, if you haven't studied any algebraic number theory, uh, because they're the same notion in the integers. Okay, and one way one implication is always true. The prime notion is actually the stronger notion. If you're a prime in this top sense, then you're always going to be irreducible. You cannot factor. Okay, it's not too hard to show that if you can factor. Uh, if n is equal to a b, it's easy to cook up an example where n is dividing a product. Well, in fact, it is an example. Uh, n times 1 is a b, okay? Um, so yeah, I'll just go ahead and prove that. You have n times 1 equal to a b. So n is dividing into a b, that's a product, and certainly a and b are less than n, so n doesn't divide into a or into b, okay? So prime implies irreducible. It's the stronger notion, but we care about the other implication, okay? So, here's the, here's the, the crux of the thing. Um, we've got something from the quadratic residue story that's really about primality in the new, better sense, P dividing a product, okay? But what we really care about is irreducible, this other notion that I claim is not as nice a notion, but we really do care about it for this particular problem. That's unfortunate. Okay, and in particular, we want the impl implication, if P is not prime in the Gaussian integers, we want to show that it factors. Okay, unfortunately, that's the, that's the direction that's a lot harder to prove. Okay, um, it's not prime implies irreducible, it's reducible implies prime. So here's the question, when can we prove something like that? When outside of the ordinary integers are these notions equivalent? Okay. Is it always true? That would be nice. Yeah. Well, you can probably guess. The whole point of these uh, lectures, really, is that it's not always true. Okay. So, um, let me say a little bit more. I might as well put it in this video. Let's look back at the reasoning with, like, uh, the 17 example. That was the one where it actually was prime. So, the idea is that 3672 factors as 17 times 216 and 102 times 36. Uh, the idea was so somehow informally that 17 can't split up into two pieces. And what's really based on, ba that intuition is based on, whether we uh, know it or not, is the idea that any integer is made up of unsplittable pieces, namely primes in the ordinary sense, and it turns out to be the key that there's a unique way to do that. And that's the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, that any integer, and this is a, a statement about the ordinary integers, any integer can be written as a product of powers of primes in a unique way, up to just reordering them, okay? That's a very familiar statement um, to most people who've studied, you know, a little bit about numbers. And one particular case is that you can never have a, b equals c, d if all four of them are prime and they're not just reorderings of each other. So let's see how that relates to our example. 102 times 36, okay? Let's prime factorize them, okay? That's 2 times 3 times 17 times 2 times 3 times 2 times 3, okay? Um, and the claim in that it's also equal to 2 to the 3 times 3 to the 3 times 17 if you reorder them, okay? This, uh, this product, because the factors, one of the factors had a 17 in it, the only way to write the product is to have a 17 in it, okay? So one of the pieces, no matter how you split this up, no matter how you uh, divide something into this, one of the pieces has to have that 17. You can't write it as something else, like a to the a to the i, b to the j, in some clever way that avoids having a 17 in it. That's really the heart of the uniqueness statement, okay? So anytime you factorize this in, no matter how clever you are, one of the pieces has got a 17, have a 17, and so 17's got to divide into one of the factors. And it's really by the uniqueness property here. Alrighty, so this is um, the heart of the matter. In the Gaussian integers, is the analog of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic true?
do we always have unique factorization into irreducible units? Okay, or not units, irreducible elements, let's say, irreducible Gaussian integers. Um, here's, let's think about the logic of this before I, I move to the next video. If we know this, here's the claim, and again, I haven't proven much, most of this, that's not the idea. Um, if we know f unique factorization works, then I claim that's the key to proving that uh, prime and irreducible are equivalent notions. And if they are, then we're home free. Then we can actually show that um, the quadratic residue problem, which is known to be easy, has the same answer as the sum of squares problem. Our table that we've got, the, the minimal table that I've shown you, and you could produce a much bigger table on your own if you wanted to, it suggests, yes, because we were getting the same answers to the, um, the question, is this number a sum of squares, and is this, is minus one a square mod p? And um, it turns out to be true that in the Gaussian integers, we still have this wonderful analog of integer arithmetic. What we're going to see in the next videos is that that's not always true. If we just change this a little bit, change the problem a little bit, it starts to fail.